coffee and return to your seat here. We'll get started. One final uh, presentation uh, amongst many very nice presentations. Uh, Austin, uh, Bonnie, Colton, and Ed will present an analysis of crow behaviors in foraging and post roost aggregations. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Dr. Walker said, I'm Austin. I'm Bonnie. I'm Colton. And I'm Ed Omar. And today, my colleagues and I are here to talk to you about the analysis of crow behaviors in foraging and post roost aggregations. Uh, before we get started, we want to define the term roost. You guys heard it before in the other uh, crow presentation. Uh, definition of a roost is when a uh, large congregation of crows come together to sleep. Uh, many of you know that we see this down here in the wetlands every single night. It's where they come to roost. And we studied the post roost. We looked at post roost, which is about an hour after they get up in the morning they, and they'll fly to a secondary location and in theory communicate about foraging locations or uh, predators, things of that nature, in theory. The other uh, setting that we looked at was uh, foraging. This is basically what you think, what think it is, is uh, crows searching for or obtaining food. Before we got started on our own research, we wanted to uh, do a little background research, see what had been done in this uh, area. Uh, we found that there was previous focus on vocalization in crows. found a paper uh, by Montano and Alexandru that uh, looked at rooks. Uh, they looked at them and separated and when they were together and found that there were uh, different frequencies of calls. Uh, we also found a paper on uh, ape gestures by Pollock and DeWall. This one was pretty interesting. They found that um, an ape gesture in uh, could be the same gesture in a different con or in a different context can have a different meaning. We also found uh, evidence that corvids use gesture as non-vocal communication. We found a paper by Pika and Simone that looked at ravens, and they found that uh, a raven that will um, they have a sh they found a showing and a uh, offering gestures. Basically, a raven will uh, found a, they found a difference between when a raven will offer something to a different raven or is just showing it to a different raven. Uh, we did find some research gaps related to crow behavior. Uh, we found that there was limited research connecting the non-vocal behaviors with the vocalizations. We found very few uh, illustrated ethograms of crow behavior. And what an ethogram is, it's a uh, catalog of animal behaviors, that way that you can uh, analyze perform an analysis on the quantitative uh, data. We didn't find uh, any comprehensive ethograms on crow behavior. We wanted to make sure that all of the behaviors that we found in our research, we uh, put into our ethogram. Overall, we wanted to gain a better understanding of crow behavior. Questions and hypotheses. Uh, do crows combine vocalization and other non-vocal behaviors? Uh, we saw this in the uh, Montanu Alexandru paper, uh, the different frequencies and calls between the birds when they were together versus when they were apart. Uh, we also saw um, in the Pika Simone paper, the, sh the showing, and showing and offering gestures were uh, different and distinct. And what are relevant behavioral action patterns in crows and how do they relate to vocalization? Predictions. Uh, we thought that call types are so, would be associated with flight movement behavior and are context specific. We thought that they would be context specific because of the uh, paper by Pollock and DeWall about the ape gestures and how context mattered for what the meaning of that gesture was. Uh, we also predicted that call type and behavior are affected by the number of crows and foraging. Again, that was uh, supported by the uh, Montano Alexander paper where whether the crows were together or separated, the call frequency changed. Uh, now Bonnie is going to walk you through our methods. Okay. Hi. So our methods were largely comprised of video and audio recordings in the field. And so what we did is we used high quality video cameras and parabolic microphones to collect visual and audio data of groups of crows in the field and <coughs> the different contexts, the post roost aggregations and the diurnal foraging sites. And the video protocol that we developed 
is to wait two to five minutes before beginning data collection, and this allows the crows to acclimate to our presence and we make sure that we are not affecting the behaviors by our intrusion into that context. To keep a minimum distance of 10 feet, once again, so as not to disturb the crows, and this is based on our own field testing experience, typically that distance was greater. And then to record each group of crows for five to 20 minutes or until the crows leave and then to label each video with the date, time, location, and weather conditions. So we collected data from six post roost sites and 11 diurnal foraging sites across the greater Seattle area. And this is really important because we can't just collect data from the group of crows in Bothell. Otherwise, we couldn't be certain that we weren't just observing the same groups of crows every day. We need to go to different places like Issaquah, Seattle, and Mill Creek to make sure that we are increasing our sample size by observing different groups of crows in these same contexts, which will increase the reliability of our data. <coughs> and so the next thing we needed to do was for our video analysis, what we do is watch the videos and write out the sequence of behaviors each crow was doing. And we needed to make sure that we were all on the same page and interpreting behaviors the same way. And so we needed to calculate our inter-observer error. And so all of our group members watched the same video of a crow and wrote out the list of behaviors that they saw. And then we compared these data sets, taking into account a, the degree of error of mistaking one behavior for another. For example, mistaking a looking behavior for a pause behavior, those are very similar, and so that is not as great of an error as mistaking a pause behavior for saying a walking behavior. And we came up with a margin of error of approximately 5%. And this is actually a very good margin of error for inter-observer error, so we were very happy with that. And the next thing we developed was an ethogram that we are going to use to process our data. And once again, an ethogram is a catalog of all of the behaviors of a specific animal, in our case, the American crow. And we chose to represent ours as a table, and all of these you can see here are the abbreviations we came up with for all of the behaviors. And one thing that is unique about our ethogram is that it also includes the vocalizations. And this, as far as we can tell, has not been done before. C1 would indicate caw once, C2 caw twice, CK is a click. And so that allows us to be able to cross-reference behaviors and non-vocal behaviors with vocalizations. And this will also lead to the development of a kinematic diagram. And a kinematic diagram is a diagram that visually represents the sequences of these behaviors and how they are relevant based on the data from our ethogram. And finally, the last part of our project involved illustrating the action patterns. And I was the illustrator on this project. This is an important visual representation of the data because it allows for a concrete definition of behavior. When we dug into the literature, we found a lot of people were defining a head bob behavior as several different things, and that's very confusing. And so when you have illustrations, you can say, no, this is what I mean by head bob behavior, and this is what the crow is doing. And this is also valuable as an educational tool, not only for our research in the scientific community, but for the non-scientific community to show things about what these important behaviors are that we're seeing in crows. And so how do we use our ethogram and represent that in kinematic diagrams? Paul oh, is going to explain that. So uh, with the methods that Bonnie mentioned, um, these are the results of our study. So this is uh, the foraging ethogram, or the ethogram of foraging location. As you can see, it's much smaller than the one listed a few slides ago. The reason why is we wanted to focus in on these behaviors here, the ones that are highlighted in yellow. Um, they are a head up, a uh, pause, forward, walk, and look. The reason why we picked these uh, two reasons. One, um, they're the most prevalent in uh, this ethogram, and they were also the ones we would expect to see in an ethogram of uh, an animal foraging. For instance, we would expect an animal foraging to walk off it. How one would read an ethogram is you find a behavior here, one that you see first, and then uh, on the up, uh, top row, you just see whatever behavior followed, and you effectively put a tick there. Um, we use this to calculate uh, the behavioral patterns. This is uh, the post aggregation ethogram. Uh, it is very similar to the previous ethogram. However, we do have different behaviors here, 
And again, the reason for that is because these are behaviors that we saw more commonly in the posters aggregation of the site versus the diurnal activity center. <coughs> um, some key differences we saw is that there was less walking because typically they were either on rooftops, in grass, or in trees. We saw a lot more, a lot more preening. Could have been because of the time of day, could because of the weather conditions, because typically it was raining when we were going out. So uh, using these ethograms, uh, we can create a kinematic diagram, which I'll talk about in two slides. Another important part of our results are illustrating the behaviors. And the reason why is because, as uh, Bonnie and Austin mentioned, is that so many previous studies have either used different uh, behavior, uh, behavior names, or they've combined behaviors. So we want to create a <coughs> vocabulary, if you will, for us to use and for future uh, students using this research to use. So we created an entire uh, yeah, dictionary, if you will, of all the behaviors, how they look, and a written description of those behaviors. So this is a kinematic diagram. And this, these calculations are based upon the epigram from slides ago. How one would go about reading the ethogram, for instance, if you saw a behavior being a head up, forage, a hop, and a walk, you just follow the arrows around with calculated probabilities based on the ethogram. For instance, a head up <coughs> going into a forage would occur at 4%. Uh, so how you read that is that if a crow performed head up behavior, there's a 4% chance that it would forage immediately after that. Again, with foraging into a hop, after they forage, is a uh, 2% chance that a crow would hop. These are not connected, so this probability is not based on a previous calculation. They all stand alone between the two behaviors. <coughs> Here we have the posters aggregation kinematic diagram. Another thing I'd like to note is that these diagrams are not complete, and that is they do not include all of the behaviors that we noticed, just the ones that are most important. And here we use the same behaviors as in the foraging site. The reason why is because we want to illustrate the difference between the two sites. So again, we have the head up, forage, hop, walk with the vocalization we saw present. And we wanted to illustrate that there are cases where the behaviors never follow. And again, we would expect this because the locations are so different over the time of day and activity taking place. And what do these results mean? I will talk about that. So as what Colton is alluding to is that while we were analyzing our ethograms, we found something quite interesting. And that is, we found evidence of behaviors related specifically to calling. Out of the total amount of calls that we recorded down from watching our videos, we found vocalizations only following three certain behaviors, which are head up, pause, and body dip. As for the 9.3% or so, we called them anomalies, as they've only appeared about once or twice throughout the total amount of videos. And what this does is it demonstrates to us the use of novel cues combined with vocalizations. And this could be important, uh, an important aspect to the communication amongst crows. So what we did is that we created kinematic diagrams only specifically looking at the vocalizations in both the pre uh, sorry, the post roos aggregation sites and the foraging context. Now it's important to note that in the foraging context, crows are primarily found on the ground. So of course you see them out on the grass, moving some leaves. And in some occasions, you'll find a couple crows in high buildings, but for the most part, they are on ground level. As for the posters aggregation sites, crows will aggregate on a tree, and you can see them aggregate on different levels of branches on that tree. And it's important to note that in both contexts here, we have uh, evidence of vocalizations uh, being followed by the head up behavior. However, when we go to the body of the behavior, foraging has no, there's no vocalizations following this behavior in foraging sites. However, it is present in posters aggregations. And then again, in poster, uh, posters aggregations, there are signs of vocalizations following this behavior, while in foraging, there is no vocalizations attached. Now, what we can infer from this is that there is a directionality to the call. The movement of the head of the body of the crow can be associated with the crow it's trying to communicate with. So, for example, if we look at a posters aggregation site and we see a crow doing a head up motion before doing its uh, vocalization, we can infer that the crow is trying to communicate with a crow that is above it. And conversely, if it does a bite uh, behavior following its vocalization, it may be um, trying to communicate with a crow below it. We, we, we would have videos to show you for this, but computers are not exactly the greatest thing, but you got to trust us on that. So what can we conclude from this? Well, going back to the research questions that we had for our project, it says, do crows combine vocalization and other non-vocal behaviors? Well, we found preliminary evidence, preliminary evidence uh, that crows use non-verbal behaviors with these calls. And our second question, 
What are the relevant behavior, behavioral action patterns in crows and how do they relate to vocalizations? Well, we've shown evidence that there are three specific behaviors, the head up, the paws, and the body dip, which seem to show a directionality to their calls. And finally, the question that we, the overall question that we use to formulate our entire project is, are posturing and gesturing, which are non behaviors, uh, only, unique, only unique to primates? And we have shown some evidence that there's possible important gestures that are performed at the same time as these calls. So again, in, in a parallel to the ape studies, a ape who is pointing at another ape in one specific context could mean that it's asking for help in a fight. Well, if you take that same, the same two apes, the same gesture, but in a completely different context, the ape that's pointing to another ape could just mean that it's trying to ask for food or, or in that context. So we're looking at both the foraging and closures aggregation sites. We can see that there could be a directionality to the behaviors of crows trying to communicate with one another based on these two contexts. <coughs> All right. So finding that our findings show that there appears to be evidence of a connection of specific behaviors attached to vocalizations. So what can we do with those findings? Well, we can begin to collect more video data collection in the field to hopefully solidify that these three specific behaviors are the only ones that are doing it. Or we can find out that our so-called anomalies actually do play a factor in vocalizations. Uh, we can, this again will allow us to have more in-depth comparison of behaviors and vocalizations. We can gather enough previous data for, the com for comparison. So again, as we know earlier in the previous presentation, of uh, previous aggregation is similar to that of a poster's aggregation. However, instead of congregating uh, in the morning, they congregate in the afternoon prior to going to the roost to rest. And then we can finally, to experimentally test our behavioral hypothesis. Now some of you are wondering, how are we going to do this? I'd like to introduce you the Crowbot <laughs> version 1.0. Now with the Crowbot, we'll be able I know, right? It's pretty sweet, right? <laughs> I'll credit the body. Again, this is just primary concept. We'll add lasers later. You but I'll... On a 3D printer, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it could happen. So, bring this cross, we'll get to this work as soon as possible. So, we'll use the crowbot to compare responses with and without vocalizations. So, for example, we'll take our crowbot, put it in a poster's aggregation site, so a tree here in Bothell, and then begin to test whether or not what specific aspect of communication um, uh, we're testing specific communication. So we can just have the crowbot do the behavior, so the four head-ups in succession. We can just have it do the vocalization, so four cause in rapid succession. <coughs> and then we can combine the two, the four head-ups associated with four cause in succession, and see how the crows respond to it. And we're able to see what is the primary aspect of communication that's important. Is it simply vocalizations? Do the head movements have play any role, or is it just mechanistic behavior? So with, the, with that, we'd like to thank you all for coming to see us this evening. Uh, we'd like to thank our mentor, uh, Professor Dr. Wacker. <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Dr. Wacker. <laughs> Professor Dr. Wacker. There's a PhD in somewhere. Uh, and we'd like to open the floor for questions. Dr. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, Bonnie, did you illustrate all those yeah. crow yeah. movements? Yes, every, I did. Every, every single behavior. Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's all me. Yeah, oh that's such a great example of how art can be used to really make a significant contribution to science. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on this project. I wanted to drop <laughs> let's, let's be honest, if she was not here, the best we'd show you would probably be stick figures. Let's be honest. <laughs> So we're very thankful that Bonnie is here with us. So. Yes, Professor Wendt. So you saw three different uh, behaviors that were associated with pause. But then according to your data, it looked like you only saw the three behaviors associated with pause in the post-rush aggregation and not in any of the foraging behavior. And the foraging behavior only saw one behavior that was associated with pause. Um, and so your hypothesis was that head up might be talking to a bird above them, body down might be talking to a bird below them. In that foraging behavior, were you seeing birds primarily talking to birds above them, suggesting that that head up was a heads up? That's where our hypothesis started from, is because since they're all on either ground level or at least the like, same altitude, all the other crows present were above them, so therefore there was no downward directionality in any call, it was all upward. Though we didn't have, like, we don't have data to say that they were 
calling to a specific burden, so to make sure you don't have that. Did you see body hits during therapy? Uh, no, because well, because usually again when we saw body dips, it was the whole entire body dip of the crow, including the head to the ground. Feet. Head to the ground, so mm -hmm. it would not be the same behavior. Yeah, so it wouldn't be the same behavior. A body dip is complete, like. Again, if you have a video, it would be great, but for the meantime, it's the whole body dipping down <laughs> without movement of the head at all, and, and then doing this vocalization. So it's different from a foraging where the crow, the entire body dips, head sticks its head down, moves some leaves around food, and it comes back up. So in other words, you didn't really see that body get behavior in the foraging sometimes? Correct. So, Correct. But you did see the positive behavior, and that was not associated with yeah, that, that's true. The positive behavior is not associated with specifically with calls in either posters or with the foraging. It happened in other circumstances as well. But what is the difference there is that the cause did come after the pause. In the posters. In both. I'm oh, sorry, excuse, excuse me, in posters, sorry. Yes, in posters. But not in posters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So looking at just the, the heads up behavior in both the posters and the foraging, when you saw calls, were specific calls isolated to either posters or foraging within the heads up behavior? Like calls as in like, like different amount of syllables or a history of Right, the thing. specific calls you see, say, a specific CA or a, a C5 or a C or a C plus 5 call isolated to only posters or to only foraging within heads up behavior, were you able to determine if certain calls were associated with it's not something we specifically yeah, we, did, we didn't look for it. There, there may be, and it might be good for the next quarter of students to look into, or uh, Bonnie who, and Ed, or both yeah, continue yeah. next, or Colton, <laughs> to look into next. No yeah. yeah, but also we we chose foraging because we couldn't ha we couldn't gather enough pre roost data. So if we gather it, it would be, be easier to compare the two contexts in behaviors because in foraging situ uh, the context of this, crows are most likely to not really communicate as we've seen that there's only really head up uh, behaviors followed by vocalization while the rest are not. It's again primarily at, the, at posters aggregations, they're most likely communicating about foraging sites to go to at, at during diurnal activity centers which are throughout the day. So usually when they're at the foraging site they're not really going to communicate per se that, hey, come here to this foraging set where you're already here. That's of course assuming our process. That's assuming our process is correct. Anyone else? All right, let's thank these guys again. Thank you, Jeff. I watched. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming to our bio showcase. And if you have,